I'll just introduce myself very, very quickly. Uh, I'm Mike Paquette, and as you can probably tell from the screen in front of us here, I'm with People First Fundraising Solutions. And this is uh, my company. What we are is a fundraising consulting agency. And we're based in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. And essentially, we work with nonprofit groups and charities, uh, primarily of a grassroots community based nature, although there are some larger ones and some bellwether groups that we do work with. But primarily, those that uh, are, are the most in need we find are the ones that don't have any real solid in house fundraising or fund development expertise and so we work with them to help them get past whatever's holding them back from becoming sustainable and of course during the the course of this pandemic i think this is hitting a lot of groups hard where um they're those that have been very very dependent on uh, you know one or two major funders or government funders or united ways they're the ones that are really finding it tough to you know keep their doors open and really keep themselves afloat especially when a lot of uh, funding reserves have dried up in, in recent months in, within, during the past year. But um, we work with them to basically enhance their base of support, and that can involve uh, fundraising, revenue-generating activities like appeals and campaigns and grants and uh, special events, uh, individual giving um, initiatives, corporate philanthropy, service clubs, foundation, private and public. And, uh, but it also means addressing some of the, uh, what, what we like to call the, the fundraising engine parts. That is like the, the systemic elements that, that make a fundraising program actually excel. Things like um, stewardship practices, volunteers, having a, a strong case for support. Um, and of course, having what we're gonna be talking about here today, a very reliable and a very, um, a, a very solid and thorough CRM, you know, customers, relationship management system and uh, you know also known as a donor database something that can track relationships which we're certainly going to be getting into um, but I'd also like to introduce uh, someone who is also kindly uh, uh, joining us today from uh, from India Syed um, is from Call Hub and so maybe Syed if you want to just take a, a couple of minutes just to elaborate on, on who you are and uh, what uh, who you're representing today. Uh, sure Mike uh, thanks for that um, so yeah, I'm from Bangalore, uh, based in uh, India. Um, so we, uh, I'm working with an organization named Call Hub. I'm a nonprofit consultant here. Um, so I started my career as a sales into this same organization. Uh, so I used to help nonprofits uh, with regards to their campaigns. So we have a virtual texting and calling platform. Um, a lot of nonprofits prefer texting at this point of time. There has been a change in the trend, the shift. Uh, from uh, emails to texting due to COVID, and that's been re working really well. So uh, I started working as a sales help the help nonprofits reduce their cost to run more campaigns. Uh, that was my target, and then later on I started working as a nonprofit consultant, helping nonprofits uh, set uh, select the right option for their campaigns. So that way it helps them achieve um, the fundraising goals. Uh, simultaneously, I also work with a lot of nonprofit consultants, helping our clients direct to the right consultants so they can uh, direct them and help them with the campaigns. And that way they can come and run uh, campaigns into our platform. So that is what uh, we as a call hub do. Yeah, I'm pretty much uh, new into this nonprofit industry. It's been like six months now and I'm learning from great leaders uh, available here like Dan, Eli, Mike. And yeah, I'm looking to learn more in the market uh, and upscale, up, excel myself there. Great. Well, thank you very much for for, uh, for sharing this with us today. And um, I also just want to mention uh, for myself, this is uh, my first uh, presentation for Net Squared and TechSoup, and uh, it's it, it's a thrill to do this. And I'm really looking forward to to subsequent ones and uh, just sharing different topics, uh, whether they're more, I guess artsy sort of fundraising subjects or more technical uh, things, things that are a little bit more on the systemic side, such as today's presentation. But uh, no, this is wonderful. I mean, I, I've been aware of, uh, of the work of NetSquared and, and certainly TechSoup for uh, for quite some time now. And it's it's certainly um, a, a name that I drop whenever possible. And I'm always referring people towards because you know TechSoup certainly is a, an indispensable uh, online resource for nonprofits across Canada, and in some cases even across the world. So 
by all means, uh, check them out. Um, I should also mention, just I, I'll be posting this uh, with the presentation um, towards the end, but my my contacts can be found at peoplefirstfundraising.ca. And we have, uh, we, uh, we should mention that we also have different workshops and uh, on grant writing and other fundraising activities. And so by all means, check us out. We have our sustainable solutions blog with all sorts of different articles and information that we like to post there. So uh, by all means, uh, drop us a line, excuse me, sign up and, and we would love to have you. But uh, on with uh, today's presentation. And so um, I, again, the, the, the topic that we're looking at today is the importance of a fundraising CRM system. CRM also standing for Customer Relationship Management System. Now, in this case, with a CRM, um, those of you in the private sector are probably familiar with this. I mean, as the name implies, a Customer Relationship Management CRM. Normally, this is a, a, a software application that will track sales and, and, uh, and marketing data. But in this case, we're, we're applying this to the nonprofit sector and more specifically to fundraising. So really, you know, rather than tracking sales, we're tracking donations. And so we're tracking not just donations, but really it's, it's used to collect and gather any sort of data that is related to the, to the pursuit of, of the charity's mission and, and specifically the acquisition and sustainability of resources that charities need to actually deliver their programs and services. Now, primarily when, when you know, when we think about, um, you know, CRMs, you know, in the, in the fundraising sense, uh, also sometimes referred to as, as, um, as donor databases or fundraising databases. Uh, primarily this, the, the sort of data that we're tracking here is of a monetary nature. So donations and sponsorships, but also it can be used to, to monetize in-kind donations, as well as tracking things like volunteer hours and, and basically like any sort of contributions that individuals, that organizations, government agencies, and any other um, any, any other entities in the community that are willing to contribute something that will enable an organization to deliver its programs and services. Now, on a macro level, of course, where CRMs are really useful is it really allows an organization, um, it gives an idea of the current state, the current health of its fundraising system, of its fund development strategies. It allows it to, you know, it allows it to plan campaigns. To, to basically monitor and to gauge how close they are to realizing campaign targets and whatnot. And actually, I'm just going to say, um, I'm not sure how we turn off, just as an aside here, uh, uh, I'm just going to pause for a second. Uh, is there a way to turn off the, um, the transcribing mechanism here or, or do I? Yes, have... is it totally distracting? Yes, I can definitely turn that oh, off. Oh yeah, no, it's just blocking part of it. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can also just turn it off personally. Pop up okay. where it says live transcript, and then hit hide subtitle. Hide transcript. Okay. Yeah. Are Are you going to be showing the PowerPoint? I feel like you're maybe part way into it, but we're still. Oh, seeing can you not see it? No, I think maybe you're showing the the yeah. PowerPoint, but not the displayed PowerPoint. You have to switch to that. Uh, switch your screen oh, share to the on. actual. It's a different app. Oh. Yes. Dan, I would so not have figured that out. On slideshow, if um, I'm not sure. If I got start, start slideshow. Can you guys see it? Yeah, slideshow. I could see that. I think if you click that, I think it would. Yeah, it pops to... up in a in a separate window. So if you right. share just one window, you won't get it. You'll have to stop uh, the screen share and start a new screen share on the right window, right. or on your whole screen. Yeah, yeah, totally. Or or it takes like the the fail proof way, which is like okay. share everything and uh, live dangerously. Let me try that again. Um, I'm just going to, I'm just, okay. Okay, we've got that that corrected. So please let me know if uh, if, if you don't see anything else on here. Um, actually, but getting back, I'm sorry. Uh, the live transcript, is that hide sometimes? Maybe that's, okay, there we go. Yes. Okay, now we're in business again, guys. Okay, yeah, like we were saying earlier. So on the macro level, you know, you know, utilizing CRMs, they allow us to, you know, not just to track appeals, but also, you know, it gives a, an organization an idea of how close it is to reaching any targets that it sets. Um, but really it's used just to kind of give an idea of how healthy and, and how uh, vital the current state is of the, of the fund development strategies and, and systems that are being implemented. Now, 
On a professional fundraising standpoint, however, the one utility I think that uh, that CRMs are really, really useful for is tracking relationships with donors, and not just with donors, but other types of stakeholders, such as volunteers, in-kind supporters, and sponsors, and, and others who might be in a position to contribute something, whether it's time or talent or treasure. But really, um, the CRM is, is a relationship management device, as the name implies. And, and obviously, it allows us to track each, not just collectively, but each respective relationship with each respective donor, stakeholder, sponsor, or again, whoever happens to be coming to the fore. And so the type of data that we're talking about here, I think what most of us do think about a fundraising software program, we we're thinking about, you know, tracking donations, so monetary gifts, whether it's the total dollar amount that we're tracking or the number of different types of appeals and fundraising activities that um, that a donor takes part in, but it can also track the volunteer activities that they take part in and, and the different types of appeals and the different types of projects that they support. But in addition to some of the more obvious metrics that, that a CRM is going to track, the one big thing, you know, when, when we're talking about tracking the relationship, it's not just the monetary, it's not just the hardcore numbers and figures that we're worried about. It's also the anecdotal information. I think, you know, much like, uh, again, anybody with a sales and marketing background, I think really understands the importance of relationships and getting to know your customers. Well, in the nonprofit sector, you know, a parallel to that is getting to know your, your donors because your donors really are your champions. They're the ones that make everything possible. And so understanding what motivates your donors and what keeps your donors on side, what brings them on side, what causes them to go away from time to time. So, so a, a very, very useful CRM is one that is also able to store a number of, of personal as well as anecdotal information that is relevant to a donor or a sponsor or a stakeholder's ability to make a gift whether it's a gift of money or their, their personal time and energy or their connections or their in-kind support. And so we're talking about, you know, you know, just by example, we'll get into some other metrics very, very shortly, but things such as their current job status. So are they currently employed? Have they been laid off? Have they been affected by COVID in some very negative way? Uh, in some rare instances, people have actually been positively connected, but also, you know, other aspects of our donors' lives, such as how many kids do they have? What is, what's their kid's situation? So do they have kids in university? You know, in other words, like, do they have educations to pay for? Do they have braces to pay for? Do they have kids who are getting married? So uh, obviously they might have a wedding to pay for or a dowry to put together. Um, you know, do they, you know, are they involved with other organizations? Are they, you know, do they have other charities that they champion or other causes that are near and dear to their heart? So understanding, you know, just the different aspects in, in the lives of our donors so that, you know, we can track the relationships as we go along. And this way we would know in any given situation as to whether or not they are in a position to make a donation or to make a commitment of time and energy or a combination of something. Do they want to enhance things? Do they want to take a step back? And once again, this is where a CRM is a, a very useful instrument because this enables us to track things as we go along. Now, in addition to you know some of the stuff that I mentioned here, um, getting to know our donors, our donors don't want to be seen as an ATM or as simply as a Pez dispenser of money. They want to be seen as a partner, as a stakeholder, and and basically more more importantly as a person. So, one of the things that uh, that is always nice is that personal touch. So. Having information such as their birthdays and anniversary dates, you know, their children's birthdays, their, uh, you know, their, their children's wedding anniversary dates, you know, their grandkids' birthdays and the like, you know, just being able to know these so that we can send, you know, um, you know, a nice little notice of, of happy birthday or congratulations on the promotion, the, the kind of things that a person would expect us to know. And that's the thing, when we, when we pretend that we, when we say that we know our donors, we want to be genuine, we want to be organic, and we want to be honest about it. And so one way of proving that is to make sure that we, under, that we, that, we, that we're aware of this information. And this is where a CRM is very useful because that allows us to store the information and access it when it's, when it's, um, when it's important. The other thing with a CRM is, is, you know, is having one that alerts us when this information is available, such as an anniversary date and the like. Now, why this is crucial, of course, again, it goes back to that personal touch because donors want to feel like they're a part of, of not just the cause, but a part of the family. They want to be seen as a part of the solution. 
And I think the one big message that we're always trying to instill with donors at every opportunity, with every communication, is because of you, we're this much closer to realizing our mission and vision. And so regardless of whether a person is giving money or in-kind support or volunteer time or a combination of these things, you know, we want to make sure that they're aware of that, you know, of that message and just that sentiment at every opportunity. And, and basically, they, they want to be seen as a part of the family, a part of, you know, the entire um, equation that's, an, that's allowing this change to happen. And so advancing relationships and having these little personal, and so as a part of the family, it's important that we also have this information so that, again, we can actually engage them. You know, not just when, when it has something to do with, with the delivery of programs and services, but also their, their um, you know, their lives as well. But a CRM also allows us to really, in, in tracking them, we can see which ones are the strongest, which ones are going, you know, by the wayside, which ones are waning, which ones are ramping up. And so it just allows us to, you know, as we're engaging our, our donors, as, as, we, as they engage in what we call the donor journey, you know, we can see which you know, which ones need a little bit of touch-ups and which ones need a little bit of, uh, you know, maybe a little bit of just stepping back from time to time. Uh, now, what I'd like to do is just to invite to say, Ed, is there anything that you would like to add at this at this stage? Um, so with regards to CRM, I would say um, it would add a lot of value uh, for uh, doing fundraising because um, CRM helps you track the high value donor uh, the low value donor. So you can keep a track of which don uh, donor has been actively uh, contributing and keep that relationship uh, stronger by engaging with them. The different tools, I would say, uh, may it be email, uh, may it be uh, scheduling them with Zoom one-on-one -on -one meeting, telling about how their uh, donation has uh, made an impact uh, with the current activity for a nonprofit. And also they can uh, send them texts, uh, uh, keeping them updated with the current activity so that uh, they feel happy. And you can also send a link in the donation so they feel happy donating again and again. I think repeat uh, donations is something that adds a lot of value, uh, keeping them engaged and sending MMS is the new uh, trend that I've been seeing. Uh, a lot of customers have been clicking a picture of the situation and they've been sending to donors that way they feel more happy that because uh, you are creating more importance to him and he feel happy donating more and more. So I think, yeah, uh, having a CRM uh, would actually give you manage the entire donor uh, journey. I would say like uh, Mike mentioned, right. Starting from the, how much he donated and what good has been doing to the organization. Um, yeah. I think that is definitely uh, major purpose of CRM and without CRM, I think it's it's very difficult to track our donors and keep a relationship with them. Great, thank you very much, Syed. Yeah. So um, now, Syed also mentioned you know the importance of the donor journey, and, and I think um, you know one of the things I, I in backing up for a second, I think I, I mentioned at the beginning how uh, like what we do and what a lot of uh, you know fund you know, fundraising consultants uh, do essentially is, is help organizations to build a sustainable base of support. And by building a sustainable base of support, meaning a sustainable donor base of support, that means, you know, developing a pool of supporters that, again, have an increasing affinity or attachment to the cause. And, and so how we actually develop, you know, how we populate that base of support is by optimizing the relationships that we have in front of us. And one of the things with that, you know, so with using a CRM, this is the, the, the primary tool that an organization, excuse me, an organization would use. And, and so in setting up a CRM, there are particular metrics that we use um, when we are measuring and tracking and monitoring relationships. And, and so the data that we store um, and, and the metrics that, that we pay attention to, you know, from this data, this allows us to plan appeals to set, you know, future campaign targets. And when we're planning capital campaigns and, and annual campaigns and endowment campaigns, this allows us to identify among the people who have been supporting us, so among our donor base, which ones are in the greatest position to support us at the moment and at what levels and um, and specifically, what kind of a cultivation strategy should we use in approaching our donors? Um, are there some lapsed donors? And another very key um, 
you know, area that uh, that often gets overlooked when you're tracking relationships, nor is that have gone by the wayside. So sometimes, you know, reaching into the recesses of our CRMs can allow us to identify some lap supporters who maybe have demonstrated a strong affinity for the cause in the past. And maybe those are those are relationships we can resurrect. But the other thing in, in terms of, of advancing relationships, I think a big part of that is making sure that you know, not only do donors feel appreciated, but they feel engaged and they feel like they understand that we know that they have given and they're a reason why we have made the progress we have made. And they're the reason why these people's lives who we're serving are in a much better position than they were, you know, prior to their involvement with the, with our association or with the organization. And so making sure that they realize that they're the heroes, they're the champions, and they're the ones that are helping us to get through this this, this COVID experience as well as other, other obstacles and other challenges that we might be facing. So in terms of the types of, you know, of, um, you know, uh, you know of, of metrics that we use, again, this allows us to really chart the future and, you know, really it, it, it makes the concept of building a permanent base of support a reality by tracking each of these relationships. And so, when you're talking about you know the different types of metrics, so the different sort of units that we're going to be paying specific attention to as we track each respective relationship, um, some of the more obvious ones, of course, are going to be of the monetary nature. So the total dollar amount of gifts, I think, and the total and the number of gifts contribute. In other words, how many you know what is the collective amount of donations that a person has given, and over the course of their involvement, not just the course of the past year, but you know collectively, how many donations or contributions have they given? So that ratio of the total dollar amount with the total number of gifts is an indicator of just you know, how involved a person is because um, a person that gives a single million dollar donation isn't necessarily going to have the same level of affinity for somebody that gives 10 $1,000 gifts. And so it's so giving frequency is, is a big one here. So the total number of gifts given. So it's you know how often and how consistently they give. The types of gifts contribute, and by that we mean: are, is it strictly monetary? Is it in kind? And if it's a monetary, is it a straightforward donation? Is it a sponsorship? Is it a pledge? Is it a monthly contribution? So it, you know, it gives an idea of um, not just how varied the person's involvement is, but you know, at what level. So a person who's giving on a monthly level, as opposed to let's say sporadically or throughout the course of the year, um, either one of two things. That means they're going to have a strong connection to the organization. So they're willing to upgrade the, the frequency of their giving, or this is a person uh, who might have a little bit more disposable income. So only by taking a closer look at some of the other variables that we're going to look at, can we really you know, qualify? And what I mean by qualify, that means to kind of gauge you know, like how, you know, you know, if we know that this person is in a position to give, you know, getting more specific of how much can we expect this person to give at this point in time, you know, or maybe our expectation might have to be tailored back after we take a closer look. So the types of gifts contributed, the types of appeals participated in. So do they only give during the Christmas campaign or do they also take part in special events as well as peer-to-peer -peer appeals? Do they also take part in, uh, do, they, are, do they have a membership with the organization? Do they sponsor a table at events? Do they sell tickets? So just the, the types of, you know, the more varied the, you know, the more varied the types of appeals and the types of fundraising activities that the donor takes part in, this shows that there's there's a great willingness there to play a role across the fundraising spectrum. So the dollar range gifts, again, this gives us an idea of just the giving ability of a person when they're getting when when we're trying to take a closer look at how they're going to get involved. Now, as far as getting getting to understand um, the interests of our donors and the motivations of our donors, you know, looking at, at uh, metrics like this would give us a clear understanding of how they want to be involved and what aspects of the programs and services that we're providing would they like to support. So the types of programs supported, the types of costs that they would like to support, such as operating or capital, the types of costs they don't want to support. Um, would they like to volunteer in some you know, in some activities, whether it's fundraising related or not, the number of hours given. So obviously a person that's giving a lot of money as well as a lot of volunteer hours, this can be something um, that's an indication of that of someone who has a, a much higher affinity for the cause 
than somebody who's just dropping off a check every once in a while. So the combination of giving both time as well as dollars and cents, and maybe even some in-kind support, you know, this is an idea, this is an indication of someone, again, who has a very strong affinity for the cause itself. Now, another thing to look at here, when you're, look, when you're thinking about volunteers, um, an old saying is your, your best volunteer prospects are your donors, and your best donor prospects are your volunteers. So when you have someone who maybe hasn't given a lot of money to the organization in the past, but they take part in all sorts of volunteer activities, and the number of hours that they, that they give is, is also tremendously high or maybe comparatively higher than somebody, some of the other uh, people involved, this might be somebody you might want to convert to a, to a monetary support at some time. It's just, you know, for whatever reason, uh, some groups, especially the grassroots organizations that I come across, a lot of times it just doesn't occur to them that maybe we should be approaching some of our volunteers for monetary support. And maybe some of our monetary supporters might have some time on their hands that, that they might want to contribute. So, you know, offering that opportunity for donors to get involved in other aspects so the, the three T's we, we sometimes refer to this time, talent, and treasure. You know, these are things that we that we, we certainly want to keep in front of us in terms of the different options of involvement that we can extend to people that do have that growing affinity for the cause. Now, as far as getting to know our donors a little bit better, metrics like these can give us a better understanding of what their lives are like and you know, a little bit more about their giving capacity and their other priorities in their life as well. So other organizations and causes supported. So, um, you know, as human beings, we do have uh, that need to be our brothers and sisters keepers. And so uh, a lot of times there might be more than one group that that is, is on our support list. And so just understanding like what other causes are near and dear to their hearts and where do we stand? Where does our cause stand in terms of their personal rankings? Do they have other friends and friend, family members involved? When you see groups, you know, getting their friends and family members involved, again, this is a huge indication that there's a growing affinity for the cause. And this is somebody that you, this is a relationship you definitely want to optimize. So employment information. So again, you know, are they gainfully employed or have they been laid off? Are they retired? So they might have some more time on their hands. They might not have as much money, more as much disposable income, you know, also, is their home paid for? You know, have they won the lottery? Now, now the one thing I, I want to also qualify here is this is information that has been voluntarily shared with you know by a donor. So we're not talking about you know uh, creeping somebody's uh, personal data or uh, contravening any privacy led pieces of legislation, but rather information that has been voluntarily and willingly shared by the donors. And and, and once again, you know, only if it's information that they would expect us to have. Would I, would I suggest that we document and actually track this sort of information? And of course, storing this in the cloud can, is, you know, for security purposes, I think this, this can be extremely, extremely sensitive uh, personal data that we certainly, we certainly don't want to expose anyone to any, um, you know, identity fraud um, opportunities uh, so by, by grifters. So we certainly have to be extremely vigilant in terms of actually storing it and safeguarding this information. But also little things like this that we that we might want to track on our own. The level of satisfaction that they have with the cause. So are they happy with their involvement? Is there something else they want to be involved in? Is there are they do they have some maybe some armchair quarterback sort of feedback or constructive criticism that they might want to share? Perhaps they've got some some experience uh, with other organizations that might be similar in different communities. And so uh, any, you know, anything that they have as value add, any information or thoughts or reflections or, ex, you know, experience or expertise, skills or knowledge, other connections in the community as well. So keeping track of these, again, is, is a way of optimizing the relationship as well as getting a handle on what sorts of other assets and other interests that the donors might want to be involved. Because a, a, a person who has been strictly donating to a cause throughout their involvement might have some, you know, might have a lot of knowledge and, and skills that they might want to share. And when they're not given that opportunity to share that, that's where relationships can go south. So being aware of the different aspects of the different, you know, things that, that donors can bring to the table, such as other skills and knowledge, you know, and connections, stuff that they're proud of, you know, things that they want to share. And 
And I think looking at, you know, in this way as well, if we don't ask them, they might be highly offended. And this is where, you know, a little bit of attrition can, can also occur. Uh, and, and Syed, I don't know if you've got anything else to maybe, if you wanted to expand on anything here or just maybe uh, compliment or, or even just- well, I, I think uh, good for now, yeah. Okay. Um, you know, Syed also had, I think, uh, some, some uh, data that he also wanted just to give, I think, uh, also, I, I think to maybe expand a little bit about uh, of Call Hub's work and the impact that it has with with this illustration. I'm not sure if you wanted to maybe describe what we're looking at here, Syed. Um, sure. Um, yeah. So this, uh, why I wanted to bring this report is I wanted to show how texting has created impact in terms of fundraising. Uh, because a lot of nonprofits, uh, primarily they've been dependent on emails, but a lot, these emails are being added uh, into the pool in inbox and people pref don't prefer opening them and checking individually, uh, which takes a lot of time for them. So texting has been really working. So this was a recent successful case study with uh, we had with one of the new client uh, who never did texting before. Okay, uh, they were just dependent on emails, direct mails and other activities. Um, so they were just uh, reaching out to them to different sources, but they're texting. They wanted to just give a try for one time. They did year of the end campaign appeals. Uh, so I personally worked with them, helped them. So they did campaign for 323, as you see right in the screen, uh, they did the campaign for 323 donors list. Um, so they did two campaigns. Um, so for the first campaign, uh, pretty much the opens were like 90%. I would say they had uh, 290 open rates and uh, they didn't receive any donation. That was just a warm up uh, campaign uh, without asking anything for donation. Uh, so this report comes for the second campaign uh, year end appeal. Um, so they did campaign again for same 323 donors list. So we saw 270 opens, which is equal to 84% open rate. Usually in emails, what they have seen is like the maximum is 34% uh, open rate is what they had seen. Uh, but in texting, um, they saw like 84% open rate, which is very good for them. Uh, one thing was, uh, what was exciting for them is they received 113 responses from these 323 donors whom they reached for the first time to texting. And they were very pretty excited because they never expected that they would be reached to texting as well to keep them updated with the current activity. Uh, that is where a lot of interaction happened. And from 323 donors, uh, they got responses 113 out of which they were able to generate $71,500 donation. And if, if I could tell you how much they spent on this, it's very minimal amount. I would say it's just like $67. They spent on two campaigns and they have generated $71,500 donation. Wow. And they personally send this email to me uh, with the stats on an email. I just wanted to put this in the form of graph to you guys. So, you know, in real time, how this has been impacted to nonprofits and they are looking to run more campaigns. They recently ran uh, one more campaign yesterday and they are pretty excited to do more campaigns and they were happy about it. So this is what it has created impact in terms of nonprofits. Yeah. And uh, the costing is something that we have, we have, um, we are a pay as you go platform that which helps nonprofits to use as and when they need a lot of nonprofits, small and mid-sized nonprofits, they want to run campaigns in bits and pieces and they don't want to pay set of fee or monthly fee, right? Registration fee. That is where we brought this platform that could help small and mid-sized donors. Uh, pretty large enterprise, I'm sure they already have their CRMs in place. They have their budgets, let's say for Blackboard, for example. So they have these CRMs to track. But yeah, small and mid-sized is where they uh, rely more on these kind of uh, platforms and they were happy. So yeah, I'm, um, if, if anyone have any questions, um, I'll leave my contact details in the last slide. So do reach out to me. I would love to assess like uh, how you have been reaching out. And me and Mike would love to help you and uh, take this next step to help your success, bring success. Yeah. Great, thank you very much, Sayed. Sure. And, um, and so just to kind of start to bring things, uh, you know, home here, I think like, you know, when you're looking at these metrics, I mean, like, what is the utility? Like, how are they important? Well, in essence, as you've heard us uh, mention, it allows us to really track and trace the you know, the, the donor as they embark along the journey and by embarking along the journey, we're, we're talking about, 
the, the path that a donor follows when they first become involved with an organization. And they, you know, not just when they make that first gift, but when they make the first inquiry. And a lot of people think the donor journey begins with a donation. It actually begins with hello. <laughs> and it begins, you know, more or less with hello, you know, what is this and what are you guys all about? And, and so when, when a donor embarks on, on a journey, you know, they're working their way towards the first, what we sometimes call the first call to action, or I like to call it the first milestone in the relationship. And by the first milestone, for, for many of them, of course, it's making that first donation. And that might just be a, a little $10 contribution at Christmas time, or it might be dropping some quarters in a jar somewhere, or it might be buying a raffle ticket, or again, whatever the case may be. But the donor journey is basically the entire path that, that an individual who is supporting, and that individual can be a monetary supporter, a volunteer, um, a sponsor, a contributor, or a combination of these three. But basically, it, it's you know, it's where they begin as a as an entry level, you know, casual supporter to where it's it's not so much how much their donations increase, it's how much their affinity and passion for the cause increases over time and through relationship and by stewarding those relationships and. I apologize, this is actually a term I should be dropping a little bit more than I have, but really, you know, the driving force behind behind the CRM is stewardship and stewardship really complements the, the, the data that we track is the relationship, or sorry, is the result of our stewardship practices. That is how we steward relationships with each of our donors. And so it allows us to really, you know, as a donor is, is, is traveling along that, you know, the, the journey pathway, it's, you know, having a CRM allows us to identify what is the next subsequent course of action. And by the way, a course of a call to action can also be a negative. That is, it could be, I'm not in a position to help you right now, but I would love to maybe, if you can keep me on the list, keep me engaged. And so even rejections are seen as a milestone in the relationship. And even rejections are, are, are traced. And we don't want, we, we never want to see a rejection as the end of a relationship, but simply as a, either a hiccup or more importantly, just as a milestone. It's not a restraining or it's simply, we're not in a position now, but if anything, we want to make sure that their affinity is increased. And so, and so not only does this allow us to track the evolution of a relationship, but they allow us to really focus on, you know, what are the most crucial aspects of the relationship? You know, that is like, is there something that's, that's, uh, that's, an, that is uh, causing, a donor to perhaps re reduce their involvement in the organization, or is there something that's increasing it? You know, their satisfaction level. So paying attention to certain metrics allows us to really gauge the current state, the current health or or decline of a relationship. And so guiding course, guiding the courses of action and also the appropriate communications that 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 we want to use to employ. And this is something that Syed has really been sharing. So are they into texting? Do they prefer email? Perhaps they might even like more uh, more FaceTime, so more personal, more direct, or maybe they're busy people and we can't really connect with them in real time. So choosing the right communication vehicle as well, and I apologize, I realized I just grossly misspelled communication. I'll make sure that I, that I um, correct that, uh, that, it, that uh, error um, before we actually share this uh, officially with everybody. So and, and going forward then, like, you know, when we're using the data for a CRM, again, this is going to allow us to chart the, you know, you know, on the whole, it's going to allow us to really chart the future direction and the objectives of, of each respective relationship, but also understand, you know, you know, their needs are evolving. We're talking about humans here and human beings, you know, our interests are going to ebb and flow, our moods are going to ebb and flow, our, you know, our um, apathy might even set in from time to time. There might be some, you know, some, you know, uh, variables outside of our control that might cause this. But, you know, again, having having a CRM that's reliable and updated and fed is something that will allow us to really keep abreast and keep our finger on those pulses. And when we can, when we can pinpoint what is preventing a person from, from maybe becoming more engaged when we feel they should be, this allows us to maybe pinpoint that and again, guard against donor attrition. And donor and donor loss for that matter, but I think it, it's it's also something as we engage with our donors, what we're basically doing is we're working with them to increase their affinity for the cause. And the one consistent message again that we always want to share is because of you, we are this much closer to realizing our mission and vision. And something else I probably am not saying nearly enough. This is also um, something that will allow us to 
it, it, it coaches us in engaging two-way conversation. It's not just about us talking to the donors. It's also having the donors talking with us. We want to get, you know, getting a donor, you know, and building their affinity, it means working with them to get them, you know, thinking and behaving like stakeholders and not just like ATMs, but making them feel, you know, it's like taking a customer service approach. So getting their involvement, getting their feedback, understanding where they're, you know, where their interests lie, where they think, we're, what are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? And anything that can help us move forward. So optimizing the donor journey. And, and I think most importantly, this safeguards our sustainability. And so that's the whole idea is, you know, when you're, when you're trying to build a sustainable base of support, it means, you know, creating a small base and populating that base with passionate, long-term and committed donors. And having a healthy CRM is a mechanism that can really safeguard that. And so uh, again, Syed, I'm not sure if you've got anything else to share for the, the last few points that we've made, but certainly communication does play a huge role in this, does it not? Oh, yes, definitely. I think um, I have covered almost everything. Um, yeah. But um, uh, other than that, uh, folks, um, I just want to give a very, uh, a very quick thank you. And I'm going to also insert a couple of, um, uh, of coordinates for SAD there. If you want to get in touch with him and find out more about Call Hub and how this can help with peer peer appeals and, and, and other fundraising activities that might enhance your respective, uh, you know, sustainability and, and growing your bases of support. But um, sure. just wondering if anybody has any questions at all. Sure, I'll start with that. Um, first of all, a welcome to Tim Middleton. If you would like to come off mic, you know, throw a question in here, introduce yourself, love to get to know you. Um, but in the meantime, I'm Eli in Vancouver, first time, long time. Um, and what can I say? Um, basically, CRM is really intimidating to me. And so I want to get a sense of before I go through the process of even starting to like think through what is the right tool for me, what would be your recommendation for the first steps I would take to start thinking about like what is the right CRM tool? What are the needs I'm trying to address? Like, is there like a, a some steps I might follow in the in the very early process of a CRM project? I would think you would want to uh, first of all, if if you're if you're running a, an organization and you're not strictly dependent on uh, a single source of income, I think it's taking inventory of what donors you have on site, and also I think what you know, and, and by donors that again I'm not just talking about uh, monetary supporters, but also volunteers and in kind supporters and anybody you basically has is provide you any sort of support going back uh within let's say the last three or four years um and, and just seeing if, if we can maybe establish that as our base of support and 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 i think um just being able to separate each of them into the different categories of you know who are monetary supporters who are volunteers who are in-kind supporters who are let's say sponsorship contributors or those who are giving for let's say marketing purposes and is there some overlap and I think you know building some kind of a matrix where we can actually establish you know those who are those who are donating those who are uh, volunteering those who are giving strictly in kind um, and maybe monetizing those amounts a little bit if we can so you know approximately what's the value of the volunteer hours they've contributed how much in kind support have they given um, of the marketing dollars, how much of that has been going towards uh, charitable causes. And, and I, I think, you know, using that as your starting point, so we, we, we really have to take inventory of our base of support. And then once we've, you know, once we've got that, I think you want to start with the, with the basics, I think, like, the, like the, the, the metrics that we first listed here, the first five, like the total dollar amount, the number of gifts, the gift frequency, and what, and perhaps what sort of projects that they have supported. So establishing the basic metrics, I think is, would be the first steps I would take once, you've, once I've identified who those donors are that are supporting us. And, and, and if we're a grassroots organization just starting out, I think even um, prior to selecting the right CRM, um, 
just having spreadsheets and, and access documents that uh, you know that can provide us with some some data that can be transcribed into a database would be something I would certainly want to have in front of me. Cool, that's helpful to get a sense of like, yeah, to do that initial inventory and start thinking about like, what are the data sources and also like, what are like the success? Like, you know, whether that's like, you know, a financial success, but like, you know, those kinds of trackable things because, you know, you can't just put uh, uh, inconsistent things into a database because then you can't really query on it. Right, exactly. You know, producing reports and queries and downloading, extracting information is needed and, and and I think having, uh, so having the basics in inputted first can allow us to expand. And then, you know, then as we go on, then we can add other, introduce other metrics that we can track, such as some of the more anecdotal stuff, you know, as well as, um, uh, you know, maybe getting a little bit more scientific, you know, where we talk about gift ranges and mean gifts and, and, and that kind of thing. And, you know, you know, cost of, you know, the rate of return and, and, and such. Mike, what CRMs do you recommend? Uh, well, I've always, I've always been, uh, you know, Call Hub certainly is, is certainly a complimentary, and that's certainly one I would, you know, first of all, you know, urge a lot of people to check out. But but others like uh, a lot of Blackbot products are are certainly great. Uh, you know, Donor Perfect is, is a pretty good one. E Tapestry is is not bad. Uh, of course, the the Cadillac uh, that most big organizations use would be Razor's Edge, which um, one of the things I like about some of these is they break down um, campaigns and appeals. Campaigns are like the, the, the umbrella sort of um, term we use. The appeals are the little sub points under, are the, uh, are the kind of like the sub activities that support the overall pursuit. So the campaign is the war, the appeals are the battles. So, you know, as long as we, you know, any, you know, any, uh, any platform that, uh, that provides that sort of a breakdown are the ones that I would start with. Fabulous. I think, you know, that's a, a good place to start with some of those tools. And I think, yeah, Dan just shared a really great resource as well from Tech Impact into the chat. Uh, where they did a recent analysis of like CRMs with a with a lens around like integration. So instead of necessarily looking at the all-in-one tool, it's rather the it'll be like on the database, but the email tool might be over here. So it's got you know there are different approaches whether you're going to take the all-in-one or the let's like plumb it all together approach. Something that and something that that we can also sync with our social media platforms as well, and, and uh, you know and, and other communication avenues. Absolutely. Well, there we go. Thank you so much for coming together um, and leading this first session, Mike, and also for bringing Zayed in as well as sort of like the, sure. the focus area expert, you know, with some real experience around building out some of these campaigns. Um, it was such a pleasure. Now, now it's time for us to start plotting and scheming about what could the next one be. and. Uh, and I'm going to, you know, I think we'll work together to like maybe put together a bit of like a, a promo email campaign series to see if we can like, you know, start letting the Toronto audience know that that there's a new organizer coming in with like a sort of a plan for upcoming events. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you, gentlemen, for joining us thanks, as well Mike. today. It's been great thanks, uh, meeting you. Mike, thanks, Eli. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. And thank you, Eli. Thank you, Dan. And thank you, Tim. And uh, we'll probably see you in a couple of months. Count on it. And in the meantime, I will take the video, cut the front part off before we actually began, and throw that on to the NetSquared blog. Um, and I'm sure Mike will then also share out that link with all the members of the meetup as well. Great. Thank you very much, guys. Okay, Perfect. Thanks. It's a pleasure. Catch you all. Bye-bye. Okay.